thank you so much, Lisa. I want to say a big thank you to Lisa and also to Beth for joining me today. I'm um, really excited just to be able to have a, a bit of a chat with you in regards to how you can transfer from one industry to another. And both Beth and I have experienced that, certainly not experts, but perhaps can provide some insight today. And most importantly, we're here for your questions and comments as well, and also your experience as well. So please feel free. Um, I think we're, Lisa sent out a note uh, to anyone who'd registered for today, um, just asking that you send her questions. So please send questions away. Happy to answer anything at all. Um, I'm Alison Taylor. I'm Chief Customer Officer for American Airlines. And I'm going to ask Beth, who is the fabulous SVP for Avis. And if you've never worked or had the pleasure of meeting Beth, um, you're in for a treat today. Uh, she is one, I think, of the best executives I've come come across in my many years in travel. She's also an adjunct professor as well, but she's going to tell you a little bit about herself uh, first. So over to you, Beth, and thanks for joining us today. Alison, good to see you. we got to stop meeting like this. That's right, exactly. <laughs> uh, I wish I was in person. Happy to be here with you. Um, I think, Lisa, there's the next slide. Just to share a little bit about me. Yeah, I... I am with Avis Budget Group. I am responsible for sales and customer renewal, but I wanted to put together a slide for all of you just to tell you a little bit more about my background. Uh, I started a company called Omnicare, which was a healthcare company, primarily pharmaceuticals. And a, a more specific vertical to that is geriatric pharmaceuticals. But I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, so that's why you see the Buffalo Bills and the Buffalo Sabres. I love Paris. I went to Michigan State University. I'm a big, passionate advocate of Win It. And uh, Alison mentioned I am an adjunct professor at uh, Columbia University, and it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to teach those students. Um, and it's been something I've been doing for the last year. Look forward to the fall semester. It was a little clunky this past year doing it via Zoom, but we were able to get great speakers like Allison Taylor <laughs> that came in and spoke to our class. So that was a big honor for us. The other part of my life is my family, which is the next slide. Uh, I'm from a big family. I'm the seventh of seven kids. Um, at least, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So in the center there are my two kids, Grace and Sam. And I always tease about my son, Sam, because he's so different than my daughter, Grace. I have one child that is a huge spender. I have another child who's a huge saver, and that would be my son, Sam. He's 22 years old, and he still has his first communion money. <laughs> he loves to save. And this year, he's been living at our house and saving even more and getting ready to go back into the workforce. So we also have my two brothers on the, on the top right-hand corner, my two best friends from childhood and from college. And then those are my four sisters and my mom in the bottom quarter. And they are just my best friends. I mean, we had my mom and dad had seven kids in 10 years. And I tease my siblings all the time because I'm the seventh that it took a while for mom and dad to get it right. But my family is my inner circle. They're my sounding board and they're my everything. And I couldn't do my job without these folks here. So a little bit about myself, Allison, and I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, fascinating. I didn't know you were one of seven. That's fabulous. Your mom in that photo, your mom, it's hard to pick out which is your mom. She, Well, she looks fabulous, right? She'll love that. I'll tell her you said it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And so I probably can tell from my accent, but I'm Australian. So if we go to the first slide and, you know, I started my career um, actually in Australia after finishing university uh, college. Um, I did a four-year business degree uh, in hotel management and catering and majoring in uh, marketing, and also then went on and did an MBA uh, also as well. Actually, the MBA was that Starwood put me through, which was just great. Very good of them. And that was a Bond University in Brisbane, Australia. My first big role was up at Port Douglas on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And uh, it's a beautiful resort, still there, uh, still doing well. And that's where I also met my husband. Actually, I met my husband on the very first day I joined Starwood Hotels and Resorts at the Sheriff Mirage, Port Douglas. And so I always say that Starwood bought me both, uh, you know, great career and also my husband. He was actually the flatmate of my boss. So how bizarre is that, right? <laughs> That's a long story. Um, next was the next slide, please. And then, of course, went to Fiji. My son is full Fijian and we had uh, the great joy and honour of adopting him when he was 10 days old. He's full Fijian. You'll see a photo soon. And I was running the three resorts that we had 
in Fiji and also open Vomo Island. We had the Western, the Sheraton, uh, Vomo Island and the Lemuridian and a beautiful dinner hour, 18-hole golf course as well and stunning. I really enjoyed our time in Fiji. If you haven't been there, you really need to go. I know I'm biased, but they are the friendliest people in the world. And I think Texans are next, actually, on the friendly market. I also had, uh, I was in Asia for 24 plus years. Uh, here you can see Indonesia. I was both in Jakarta and in Bali. I was six years in Indonesia, um, most of that in Bali, because after the rioting that we had in Jakarta at the fall of Sahato, uh, which was a, a difficult time because my family had to be um, vac evacuated three times. I had to stay because I was general manager of that Lamuridi in Jakarta. Um, and also looking after Indonesia, we had another 24 five hotels next one and then we moved to bali which was just great sorry for the spelling error there it's indonesia if you haven't been there hindu island that displays its culture beautifully and still lives its traditions every single day in their villages it's a beautiful spot beautiful part of the world and we had nine resorts in bali and i was very lucky with my son and husband to live in the in the resorts then i moved to malaysia and looked after southeast asia india bangladesh pakistan Sri Lanka, et cetera, um, from, from Kuala Lumpur at the Sheraton there as well. And we had uh, 15 hotels just in KL alone. Then to the head office in Singapore, I spent 13 years there looking after the commercial and also all new builds and transitions. We were opening a hotel a week in uh, China and in India as well. And then I got promoted to uh, New York to our head office in Connecticut, um, and there's my husband outside a house in Connecticut, which we enjoyed. And then uh, Marriott bought Starwood. And that's when I had to change my career. Here's my beautiful family. They're my sisters. There's my son in the centre. Um, and you can see he also likes to play rugby as well. And so he's safely in Sydney, Australia. I haven't been able to see him for 14 months because of the pandemic and Australia is on lockdown and they don't let anyone leave. Um, but my son is safe. He plays for Manly Marlins, the rugby club in uh, Sydney, Australia. And you can see my great sisters there and my nieces and their babies as well uh, i really miss them all but i'm here in dallas with my husband and so that's a, a little about me uh, as well before we get into the discussion as well and i hope all of you have been safe and well during this time what a confronting year and a half it's been mm -hmm. um <laughs> and i know from beth as well business is really starting to come roaring back and that brings other issues with it at the moment for example we got 180,000 calls yesterday in reservations Normally, we'd get about 100,000 calls a day in reservations. So, my goodness, people are back on the road. And, and that's a great thing to see that light at the end of the tunnel. Are you seeing the same in the Avis group? And we, we sure are, yeah. We're bouncing back with vengeance, which is good. Um, it's good to see the turnaround. And, in fact, it was my first uh, in-person presentation yesterday. And I have to admit, Alison, I was a little rusty. A bunch of us got into an elevator. No one pushed the button. <laughs> We're so used to working from home. Yeah, so, but it was so great to be back and, and be in the front lines and just looking people in the eyes instead of through a camera. So uh, we're happy to be back, and, and Avis is back and bouncing back with um, an abundance, which we're excited to see. Cool. I'm here at our beautiful office at Skyview in, in Dallas, and we never closed our office, uh, and all the offices were always at the office. We were here five days a week. Our teams weren't, of course, though we're, we wouldn't insist on that, but we needed to support our frontline flight attendants, skate agents, pilots, you know, who were out there um, every day, et cetera. And I think that really helped me uh, also get through the pandemic, frankly. So I don't know about you, but I, I think you know when you're working for a good company how they treat you during a time like this and the culture in Americans become even closer. Um, even we've now got, I think, probably the, the best um, culture we've ever had with our unions and labour leaders. Um, we've all really come together. So I, I think, you know, you learn so much in these times when it has been just so difficult. I agree, Alison. I mean, we were we were tight going into the pandemic, and I didn't think we could get any closer as as a as a team. And we certainly did. And you're, we were with you. We had a small group of us here in Precipity, New Jersey, that um, worked from the offices because the same thing. We had people in the front lines, and we wanted to be there with them too. So, but we're starting to cascade in back, which is great, and we're starting to do a big return from work. So, 
Cool. That's great. Maybe yeah. go to the next slide if that's okay, Lisa. Thank you. Hey, and also, I thought this was great. Um, you know, Beth had prepared a couple of slides to, to go through. And while we're having just a look at that, I'd love, Beth, tell me a little bit about your journey from going from Omnicare and, you know, to Avis. And just to let the, the audience know what you experienced, what happened, what, what was your journey. I'm really interested to, to understand that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. And thanks and thanks for asking. I mean, a lot of people have asked me, like, what brought you to travel from geriatric pharmaceuticals? And uh, it's funny because it was actually, and this isn't one of the skill sets that we're probably going to review today, but I do think it's an important one. And that's impactful networking. And I had been working at Omnicare in a um, Marriott in, in Covington, Kentucky at the time. And it was basically a remote home for me and also one of the partners of a consulting firm that was there as well. So for three years, she worked at this firm for Omnicare as a consultant, and I also was working there. And so we became fast friends. And through that project, you know, we would have dinner together, have a glass of wine, talk about our families, and we're still friends to this day. But she moved on to bigger, better projects, and we kept in touch. And when she left, there was a lot of change that started happening at Omnicare. And one of the big changes was our CFO was becoming the CEO. And the reason I wanted to get her take on it is because she really did know the dynamics within the office. She really knew about uh, some of the qualities and characteristics of some of the leaders. And so I wanted to get her opinion on what she thought about some of these changes. And she was real straightforward with me. And she said, you know what, I think you should get your resume together. And I got to tell you, Allison, I, I, I had not dusted that resume off for years. It had some really dated um, experience on there, like even stuff I did in, in, in college and in high school. So I really had to resurrect that. And, uh, and she was working at Avis. So she called me three days later and she said, hey, I'm doing some project work at Avis and they're looking for the head of sales. I think you should go there. I think you would fit right in. And I remember asking her, like, w what would I sell? She says, well, you sell, you sell car rental. <laughs> and so she was telling me kind of the leisure and commercial and how it was structured. And, and she just said, forget all that. You're going to love the people. You're going to love the culture. So she also told me, you better hurry because they're pretty hot on a candidate. So I flew over, met the team, absolutely loved it, um, was blessed enough to be able to, to take this job. And to this day, she's still a dear friend. And I actually say to her that she's my corporate angel because she's the one who connected those dots. And that's how I kind of got, and she saw things in me that I didn't even see in myself that she thought would be a really, really good transition over. So um, I am thankful to her, grateful to her, and happy to be here at Avis Budget Group. And Beth, I think you're right about, you know, intentional networking that, you know, quality networking is important, but you also eventually just have to trust someone, don't you? Have yeah. a mentor and, and trust them. I think that's really paid off for me. I had Miguel Coe when I was at Starwood. He was our CEO and chairman. I tell you, if he told me to jump off a cliff, I probably would have done it because he'd never <laughs> give any advice that wasn't good for you. So right. I think sometimes you do have to find those people. And when they give you advice, just trust the advice. Yeah. Um, you know, don't second guess it because they can often see so much more and are so much more clear-minded uh, about you than probably you are yourself, right? Because um, we can be hard on ourselves, I think especially sometimes females. Um, yeah. And just like someone ringing you and saying, hey, go for it, and, and you did, right? You trusted them. I think that's marvellous. I did. I, I'm not going to tell you I wasn't a little nervous. I mean, I, I love my job. I love my team. I love my customer base. I had some uneasiness there. Uh, but I, it, it all kind of went away when I met the team here. And I'm just so grateful that she connected those dots, you know, and, um, and gave me that opportunity because it's something I've, I've never looked at. And travel, oh, my, I try to tell my kids and the students, consider the travel industry. You know, it is, it is I would, I, I always say it's kind of the industry that hugs your back. And not to sound corny, but it's just so hospitable and friendly and warm and welcoming. And, and I don't know if people know enough about it. Uh, and, and I want to put it in all of these students' consideration set when they're looking uh, for a new career. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, frankly. Tell me what was the, what was the hardest thing, though, uh, in moving, besides probably leaving the people behind, uh, Omnicare, et cetera. What was the hardest part? What, what is the part that you, you feel that, you know, you could have been better prepared for or you learned about, et cetera? 
I think it was just the first day of school jitters type thing, you know, just the unknowns. And, and what I decided to do when I came here is I certainly knew how to run a sales organization. I knew how to drive results, but I didn't know the car rental business. And so I, t- I took a seat back and said, hey, I, I'm going to be the student and you can all be my teachers. I didn't do anything knee jerk. I took a full year out in the field. And Allison, you know this better than anyone. If you go out with sales folks and you shadow them, they, they oftentimes will take you to the customers that absolutely love us, which is great. But I wanted to go to the ones that were vulnerable or at risk or combative. or And I wanted to see how those sales folks did in those situations. Were they instinctive? Did they have empathetic listening? Um, were they good troubleshooters? How do, how do we uh, uh, fix it? How do we do a course correction? And those are the types of, of folks that I wanted to make sure that we kept on board. Uh, how do they handle adversity? Rather than just going to all the customers that love us, which is great, and we all have them and we're all appreciative of it, but what about the ones that uh, are uneasy uh, or vulnerable? And those are the ones I, w- I wanted to see their skill sets in front of that. So I took a full year for that. And, and I always, if you ask my team, and I know some of them are on here today, I always encourage disagreement. I always encourage dialogue. Uh, I, I don't like to surround myself with a bunch of yes people. And, and that's what I wanted to make sure that I did when I came here, because I didn't want to bring a bunch of my sales team over. I wanted to take a look and assess the talent that we had here and build upon that. I think that's really cool because um, I also took a lot of time just to, I visited every major station, both domestically and globally, and I was gone for months. You know, I come back to the head office and my boss at the time, uh, Kurt Stachy, I always remember him saying to me, he said, wow, you're traveling a lot. I said, you've got to see the team. You've got to see the customers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very common between you and I, Beth. And I found from that that people would confide in me. And it's those times in the back of the Uber or taxi as you're going to an appointment or as you're standing on the curb and they're telling you what they really think. And I held all hands, of course, in every location, but it was actually the individuals, that's where you get the real information. And also exactly as you say, you see all levels of customers, those that are actually really on board, <clears throat> you know, part of the, the DNA of the airline, etc., and others, frankly, who feel that they should be going elsewhere and, and they tell you why. So I, I think that helped me enormously and it also made me see the different leadership styles of my team leaders but in a but in a, a good way, not in not in a I'm going to dig into and play gotcha, but in a way that you know I could just spend time with them so that they understood me a bit more and I certainly needed to understand them. Yeah. And you just you just mentioned, Allison, something that I think you're tremendous at, and that is establishing trust quickly. Right. Asking those right probing questions to, to establish that trust. And that's something that I don't think anyone's better at. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your train? You, you came from the hotel over to airlines. So uh-huh. same same industry, but interested oh to know some of the transferable skills that you, you still use today. You know, it's interesting. I had, I still do. I get even five years into the airline, people still say I'm new to airlines, etc. It's interesting because it is, as you know, there's hotels, there's car, there's the airline. But with the airline industry, I, I find they are quite specific about what they think people need to be in the aviation world. And, you know, I think it's great that now that there are others, like Doreen now from Marriott, who's gone to be head of sales for United. Right. And my um, my predecessor, actually, at American, he went over to IHG. So I do think they're very transferable within travel. Certainly all the customers were the same. In fact, the mm. top 20 for Starwood corporate-wise and the top 20 for American Airlines were almost identical. But what I found is the the best thing that I could do was find people who were going to educate me. You mentioned it before, Beth. And I asked them to sit me down and teach me about what they did, why they did it, what reports they look at, what were all the abbreviations. <laughs> and I felt like I was in school for the first couple of weeks when I started out on the road, right? But that helped me at least understand the, the sort of, you know, the basics. And I'm still trying to nail those basics, frankly. You know, it's a complex business. But right. it was very interesting, uh, very interesting how quickly the customers uh, embraced the change and uh, I think if the team just wanted someone to care for them, 
And so it doesn't matter what industry you're in, leadership skills uh, can be similar and appropriate and you learn what you need to learn about that industry. So I would invite the people in this audience to think broadly and think outside their industry um, because actually it was not as hard as I first thought. I'm not saying it's easy and it's confronting. Um, and leaving a company you love, and I left Starwood six months before the integration with Marriott, that was the hardest decision I've ever made. Mm. But, you know, I, I don't regret it. Uh, I've actually employed some of those Starwood people <laughs> actually working uh, actually with, at America now as well. Um, because if you're a global leader, you can be a global leader anywhere or in, I think, any industry. I've lived and worked in eight countries. Um, and I grew up in Saudi Arabia and London besides Australia. And I do think making sure you're a, an appropriate global leader is also important because a lot of the big travel like Avis, right, these are global companies and they expect you to have a global outlook. So that was one of the things I felt that I could also bring to American Airlines because while we fly globally, we're very much as we should be, uh, a North American carrier, it's an 80-20 rule. So I just found that I was able to bring things to them that they're grateful for and I also learned and they cared that I was uh, an authentic leader. That's what they really wanted. It was really interesting. I don't know about you, Beth, when you, I, was, I was being interviewed. They didn't care about if I even knew the customer. They just kept asking about leadership. So hone your leadership skills and get as large a team as you can. Because uh, when I was promoted during the pandemic, I've, I've gone to around 7,000 team members now. And, and it's the leadership they care about. What, what do you think, Beth? What do you think of what they're looking for, for for you? I think, and I think we demonstrated it both you and I through the pandemic. I think they're looking for a compassionate leader wow. and, and exercising that compassion and understanding the work-life balance, especially through the pandemic, right? And, and how flexible you are. I think that breeds the most amount of loyalty and it brings you the best worker. I mean, let's face it right now, everybody's recruiting, right? There's a big demand uh, for, for employees to come back to work. And so keeping your top talent, I think, is always something that was really, really important. So I think compassion leaders are, are, are number one uh, and understanding and authenticity. And you said that, Allison. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I do have a question for you, though. When you talk about all the different places in the world that you've lived, which, by the way, I'm envious of, though, your pictures were beautiful. <laughs> Unbelievable. They look like a brochure. Um, do you find that your transferable skills differ from different spots in the globe or are they pretty much consistent with everywhere you lived? I think it's, um, I think mainly they're consistent, but I did find, especially in Asia, it was very important for me to change the way that I approached team members and customers and also conducted meetings. Interesting. Yeah really earn the right uh, to have uh, business discussions in Asia. Yeah. Um, and not many of you, of course, have probably conducted sales calls in Asia or, or visited for work. Um, it's very important you establish credibility and relationship first and then talk about business second. And I lived in Indonesia for six years, as I mentioned. It's the largest Muslim population in the world. And it was very important that I took time to understand uh, the Muslim faith be respectful of that. And I had all older males reporting to me in that role as well and to show them the level of respect while still being accountable for great results and moving things forward and stimulating change. That, for me, was probably the biggest learning going into Asia, to be able to have that balancing act of the em empathy, understanding, and making sure you were culturally relevant and respectful while also stimulating change in a way that was effective. And so that is can be quite different to, say, working in, say, North America or Australia or the UK, for example. Fascinating. I found that I did a lot of reading, Beth, and I was going to just ask you, well, how did you prepare when you were either going for your interviews or just starting work at Avis? What sort of preparation or what, what did you think through as well? You know, my, my number one advice or tip for interviewing is just to be yourself. I remember coming to this Avis interview and again, I told you I was a little rusty because I hadn't, I've been with the same company for 20 plus years. 
But I just remember talking to my husband saying, I'm just going to go be myself. And if they don't like me, I don't want to work there anyway. Right? right. So again, going back to that authenticity. I also think that when we talk about transferable skills and you may get asked that on an interview, right? So say it's problem solving. Well, everyone can say that they have that, but I think on an interview, you have to be prepared with examples on how you actually applied that skill. Right. And in some of those conversations, and, and I know Allison, you and I could share war stories forever, but I, I definitely think some of those problem solving skills are some of the toughest conversations you can have, right? Because you're taking on a challenge head on. And I remember one of them back in, in the pharmaceutical days where I had seen that the the, the number one salesperson was not getting the commissions that we were paying out. And what we had was, and this was a big problem, was we had these residuals in place. And so she, the, the person that was getting the most payout wasn't necessarily the number one sales leader. And so what we decided to do as a team was to actually put a year to date uh, so you got to get 90% year to date to be able to get your residuals. Not an easy conversation, had a lot of rationale behind it, but we used it as a team and we used it as a problem solve and it actually worked for the company because then everyone started to track year to date at least 90% or better. But it was not an easy thing. So I think for an interview, I think you need to have examples of your transformative skills. And you, you can say, listen, I can do this here and I can do this there. And this is an example of how I actually accomplished it. And have two to three of those examples ready when you're on the interview. I, I couldn't agree more. And also make sure that you are vulnerable at times. So many people, I don't know about you, Beth, if I, I was just doing, conducting some interviews last week. And we've got a, a great senior role here in digital. And it was interesting that the people that resonated with me, not just the, the technical expertise, but those that showed vulnerability and were really honest about themselves. So think through that and what you're going to answer with those hard questions. Because, of course, you want to put your best step forward if you're being considered for all of course but no one is perfect and if you come across like waxing lyrical about everything it can come across as that you're not self-aware so think through that and have those examples ready but right be your normal self and bring your whole self uh to that interview like you should for, for work as well and hey i I always was so impressed, Beth, when um, you did ask me to thank you, join you uh, with your students, um, and you asked some great questions. What are the things that you tell your students, and maybe there's some of them are here and on the next slide, about what's most important? Because, you know, I, I want the audience to, to get full advantage of, of your expertise. I, I was so impressed uh, at the, um, the great questions I got that day from your students. Yeah, they're not shy, are they, Allison? <laughs> right. <laughs> I love. I do love my class. And Lisa, yeah, you can go to the, the the next slide. These are some soft skills that matter most that we put. Obviously, work ethics one, um, but the next one will show you some ones that our class we we all talk about. This growth mindset, and you you mentioned digital. Oh, it's all about digital in the classroom, right? In terms of either B two B or B two C, we talk a lot about that in class. But what's really interesting is is they think that there's transferable skills or characteristics or qualities. It depends on what kind of organization you're going to go work for. Now, hear me out when I say that. So they're kind of teetering. Do I go to a startup or do I go to an established corporation? And if I go to an established corporation, do I need different skills than I would at a startup? And my answer to that would be yes. Right. So if you're risk averse, maybe you shouldn't go to a startup. It depends on the culture of the established corporation. Uh, you find out as much as you can. Do a 360 is what we call it. And what that 360 means is, yeah, you can find out what you want on, on Google or Wikipedia or whatever, but see if you can actually talk to one of their customers or their clients or an employee. And they do a lot of the due diligence before they decide where they want to go and work. And so a lot of those transferable skills depends on what organization and culture they're going to go work for. But they seek advice just like they did for, from you, Allison. They really want to know what we look for when we're hiring folks. And, and, and that's why I always go back to compassion. And I love that you said vulnerability. I'm big on vulnerability, makes you human. And it does make you self-aware. There's nothing worse than, than a boss that seems incredibly disconnected, right? And not understanding what everyone's kind of going through or what the customers are going through. So you really want to be connected. And that's why my favorite part of my job is to be in the front lines in front of the customers. Being in the office is fine, but I think really where I learn the most, and I still learn every single day, 
is being in those front lines and I get the best ideas from our customers. And so the students actually ask us a lot about how they can separate themselves from the pack. So if I have all the same credentials as the student sitting next to me, how do I separate myself from the pack? And, and with social media and LinkedIn and all of that, they really work on their profiles and they work on their network. And they try to warm up an interview in terms of maybe knowing somebody, even if it's two to three degrees separation, it helps them in that interview process. They have to do all the legwork, but having that kind of connection of the dots is really, really helpful and instrumental when they go out and look for a job. But that's some of the that's some of the advice that they seek, and I know they certainly did that from you. By the way, Allison, not to toot your horn, but you were rated the number one speaker for our class. So thank oh, you for doing so that. We may have you come back for an encore in the fall. <laughs> I'm just going to get on your I'm going to get on your dance card now because I know you're going to have to come back anytime. for uh, for the fall anytime semester. Anytime for you, Beth. Anytime at all. And I don't know about you, about you, Beth. I also find that it's so important to do a bit of uh, research. I, I researched also the board of mm -hmm. American. Airlines because how yeah. the board, you know, uh, does say a lot because I was looking for other females, senior females, and you know, American Airlines has the three most senior females in aviation, other than the CEO of Air France, who's female, which is just great. Um, Maya, uh, who's our CIO, and of course, our head of HR and communications, who started as a flight attendant, uh, Elise Eber one. And so, you know, I could see that they really walked the talk on that. And we have uh, four females on the board. Board, and we have four black team uh, executives as well on the board who are really, I mean, they are huge team leaders. One of them worked for Obama for many years. Um, they are they are really uh, just leaders um, uh, in industry. So I, I, I felt reassured by that because while there was a lot of talk I could see in all the research about diversity and, and females, etc., the, the aviation industry isn't known for a lot of females. And so, but I I could see American Airlines was making sway in that area, which is good. And I think that's very important. I also did quite a bit of research about Doug Parker, the CEO. And while I think you should never take a job just because of the boss, I really don't, right? Those, those people can change. Uh, it should be the overall culture and perhaps career growth and all the other things. But I, I do think reporting to someone who is, you know, just outstanding and a human being is really important as well. Uh, and someone you're going to be happy with and not, you know, and be happy coming to the office every day and, and, you know, and working for, I think that's really important. So I actually did, he, um, Doug Parker called me out of the blue, Beth. I don't know if you know this, um, you know, this story, but literally I was at Starwood. Um, Marriott had bought us, but it hadn't yet gone through. And Doug Parker called me out of the blue. I actually caught, thought he was calling to, um, to complain that he must have had <laughs> an experience with one of our hotels. And so I was sort of like, oh, and he finally said, Alison, you have no idea who I am, do I? And I said, no, sorry, Mr. Parker, I don't. Should I know you? And he said, I'm chairman and CEO of American Airlines. And I still thought it was a complaint. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. Have we let you down? And he said, no, Alison, I wanted to see if you could come tomorrow to New York and because um, I was up in New Canaan, Connecticut, and we could have a chat. And I still thought it was a complaint. And so, of course, I went down next day. It was a sad day to have a chat to him. And actually, he, he wanted me to join. But then he also asked the person from Egon Zender. So one of the things, Beth, I did want to touch on today, and I hope you're okay, is headhunters. Mm. Um, I had incredibly good experience with Egon Zender. They were outstanding. They even helped me with things like my package. I didn't mm. even know what positive space was, right? <laughs> On here. So <laughs> sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Like you, I, I hadn't dusted off my resume, yeah. right? I, I had been very happy with the company. So I think sometimes they can be of great help. But I have had friends who have perhaps also had a time when headhunters headhunter, head haven't been their partner haven't been their friend. So I, I do ask the audience to be very careful. Uh, I don't mean to solicit that you should go to headhunters, but be wise and understand how they're paid for their services because that can be very important as to what is driving their behaviour as well. But a couple of the big ones, obviously, in, in um, travel are extremely good at what they do, and Egon's end was certain fabulous. I don't know, have you had experience at all, Beth, on that you want to talk about? Not, not really personally, because as I said, my, my good friend and partner of a consulting firm actually connected the dots here, but we do use them. 
uh, and when we re- when we uh, recruit and hire, and I've had really really good experiences with them, and and they really, you know, what I like about it is the consistency and cohesiveness of the resume presentation, sure. uh, or the application, and just the briefing before you even meet the top three candidates. So, uh, I, I think they can have a huge benefit, especially especially right now. That's right, and they can really help drill down. I think what can be overwhelming when we advertise, for example, say this digital role, which is a director role. You know, we had thousands of people apply, and so they're able to to drill through that. You know, with their keyword searches and everything else that it were. I think it can be really helpful as well. Yeah, and I know, Alison. I mean, we're talking a lot about moving from company to company, or even industry to industry, and I and I think it's important to point out that these transferable skills are just as advantageous when you maybe even go from a department to a department internally, right? So if you're kind of climbing the corporate ladder within your own organization, these skills are just as important. And I'll I'll give you a good example. As I started to build the sales and, and customer renewal team here at ABG, I wanted to have a variety of subject matter excerpts within my own circle. So we have built a robust team and we have, you know, ladies and gentlemen from marketing or revenue management or procurement so we could get on the other side of the desk. And and I look for these same kind of skills as we build our own sales team. So it's not necessarily for just you folks that are listening to us today for a company to a company or an industry to an industry. Think of it within your own organizations and your own Uh, job today and see if any of those can apply, even if it's for an idea that you're trying to pitch internally. So if you had to go to IT and pitch an idea and you know you're in line with some other folks that also want to get a project approved, you may use some of these skills too to get that through. So I just wanted to point that out quickly. I don't know if you agree, Allison, or not, but I really do. And I think a lot of people, when they've been in a company a long time and they move role, they should treat it more like they've moved a whole company because they need to start afresh. I often give um, my team members a book. It's a little older now, but some of the the, the wise, um, you know, uh, points in the book, um, it's the first 90 days. And have that plan for your first 90 days, like you had that plan, Beth, of going around to the field and spending so long with the field have a plan i do see too many people who just sort of slide into it and all of a sudden they're answering all the emails and and fine but where's your plan and do you have a plan for your first 90 days and that always i think makes a quite a big difference for the team to see the difference in leadership as well Um, because everyone wants to know where they're going know where the goalposts are as well Um, even in a time of, of agility um And I've got to say, uh, during this time, one of the things that we have seen uh, change enormously, and I love your point nine, Beth, about comfort with ambiguity. That's not easy for a lot of people. Um, It really isn't. Operating in the grey can be tough. So this is where a plan can help your team, especially during a time. I'm going to give an example. Normally, we take about 107 to 110,000 calls and reservations a day, say, at American Airlines. Forget the pandemic. That was before the pandemic. Now, this week, we're taking around 180,000 calls a day. We're not staffed for that. It's on hold. Um, we've had to we've had to revamp quickly. And everyone is operating in an environment they've never experienced before. Now, it's for a good reason because business is coming in, but we want to look after our customers. And you can see the people that can operate with agility and operate with the ambiguity of the ups and downs that come with what we're experiencing are coming out of a pandemic as, you know, our customers return to travel. And I found that that can be just so important. People might have all the skills, they might have all the experience, but if they can't have, be comfortable with some ambiguity or, um, you know, be nimble to change overnight like we've had to do, um, you know, honestly, uh, they seem a bit lost. And so I, I love this now because it is a changed environment, almost no matter what industry you are, but especially in travel. And have you seen that after the pandemic too, Beth? I have. In fact, I would put number nine as number one <laughs> right now. I mean, I don't, you know, obviously this is from Forbes, but when when our class looks at this, it, we, we we talk a lot about this and, and we all agree that nine should be number one for sure. Uh, I think 10 is now going to be, you know, may, could even come off the list as people start to, you know, uh-huh. return to work. But it was very, very timely at that time. Any type of fluidity, and you're right, it's not just travel. 
I think it's important to be able to be instinctive and to be relaxed and to be confident and to go into that adversity or that fluidity or that ambiguity without any hesitation. Kind of embrace it, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you've got to love it eventually. Some people can find that very exciting um, and, you know, be passionate about others. It, just, it is fearful as well. But dealing with that fear and understanding your with that, with, you know, within a great company culture can, can help as well. Hey, Lisa, I was wondering if we have any questions at all from the audience. We do. We have a question. Um, and it is from... Rita Bisser. Hey, Rita. Uh, <laughs> Rita, you can unmute and give it yourself if you like, but I can read it for you. In this world where applicants are going up against 300 plus people for a role, what is their top point? What is your top pointer to give to people to get that role? Hey, ladies. Oh, thank How you, are Rita. you? Hey, Rita. Good to hear from you. Hey. Yeah, well, first of all, well done. But, you know, I, I'm hearing from people who are out applying for roles. And again, that the, like they keep saying to me, oh, you know, what, what can I do here? What stands out? And, you know, we're in a position now where we're doing some hiring. And exactly that's what's happening. And some really good candidates, you know, might not float to the top for a recruiter that, you know, is, is simply that, that frontline recruiter. So I think, you know, people would be interested in hearing, uh, you know, because it isn't, it isn't the person that they're going to work for that sees the resume up front, right? It's some, you know, some person in HR. Is there something that you guys would say that they should do? Because um, I'm trying to help some people now, obviously. And um, just a any tips you can give me so I can help to give them those tips. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, thank well, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Rita. Thanks for joining us. Um, well, first of all, I, I always give this tip, and believe it or not, some people don't have this, but be on LinkedIn uh, and put your LinkedIn on, on your resume. I think that's really important. Some people don't even do that, believe it or not. I also think it's important to have testimonials. That really separates the pack. So whether, and again, we talked about that 360, we talk about it in class. So if you're interviewing, you want to kind of set yourself apart, have a written testimonial from a customer, a colleague, and a direct supervisor. And, and that's always handy to have because not a lot of uh, applicants, at least in, in our pool, have that. And then it's interesting to see what a customer, a colleague, how they work within a team and then how they report within their, to, up to their direct is always really important. Yeah, totally agree on that, Beth. We also are looking at resilience. We have asked our team um, in uh, the people team who are doing the culling of, say, for this level seven that I'm employing for digital, and we asked them to look for demonstrated resilience and also, okay, base skill sets, nailing the basics of perhaps what's required for the job. But the most important was actually not their academic demonstrated resilience uh, and also passion uh, for travel uh, going forward on a long-term basis because we are looking for longevity as well. You know, for example, in Dallas, we have uh, 75,000 jobs available for Amazon and we have been losing some of our great team members to Amazon for that. So we want people who are going to be long-term uh, in the industry as well. So we are looking for some key words around that and also that demonstrated, you know, comfort within the amb ambiguity as well and authentic, caring leadership. And if we can have someone advocating for them on that, like uh, exactly what Beth said, um, someone who's written a letter saying they are, you know, they're an authentic, uh, outstanding leader, because really we're looking for, for that leadership quality as well. I hope that helps, Rita. Thank you. It does. It takes me a while to get unmuted. Thanks. <laughs> and Rita, if I could help those people, please do let me know. <laughs> I, I will. I, well, I, Mick's got a question that's coming up next, so um, it's not in the chat for everyone to see. So right. I think that, um, you know, ties a little bit to it. I'm just having a look at the chat. Yeah. I mean, same thing. It's kind of, I love the testimonials. Everything that Allison just said, if you could get somebody else to talk about an example of that is wow. to me is a beautiful thing, you know? And I also, I always ask myself what I, cause I'm, you know, in a sales role, would I buy something from this person? Do I trust that person? You know, and I think that's really, sounds super remedial, but if I, if my instinct is no, I wouldn't buy something from them. 
then why would a customer or prospect continue to buy? Or, you know, so it, it, you have to have that same kind of gut instinct as well. Great. Great, um, great question here from Mick Lee. Any advice on how we job holders can best support job seekers right now? Um, I, I'll just give you one example, Mick, and I think you did as well, perhaps, and then I'll ask um, Beth to speak. Um, I placed on LinkedIn that I was willing to help those looking for a job. I had to take it off after a while because I was inundated. And I, I, I do mean hundreds. And so now I sort of more pick and, and choose it. But I, I did help about, it was only about, I can and choose about 2025 to, to help and also what I have done separately to that um, I first on LinkedIn they came to me and I gave them some advice um, even resume writing companies etc then the second thing was when headhunters come to you Mick or to Rita or to Beth and others I uh, refer all those good people who are seeking a job so I just did that recently when Stuart Spencer came to me for a big role here in Dallas I not at all interested, but you know what? There are some great people looking for a job, and I, I sent her about uh, 10 resumes uh, and contacts for that as well. So I think making sure, and that's why I mentioned headhunters who can really help you with this and help spread the word, um, and also, of course, offering your advice on, on just how to approach interviews, especially after not having to have done that for, for, for many years, etc. Beth? Yes, same thing. I, I just had a recruiter call the other day for a healthcare placement, and I still keep in contact with a lot of uh, my folks from Omnicare and had two to three candidates that I just, I, I check with them first to make sure I can give their name out, but uh, absolutely, you know, build that network. And, and, and I can't tell you how many resumes I've taken a look at and just kind of simplify it too. Sometimes it gets a little in the weeds. And I think it, all of us that are in a position of hiring that have a stack of resumes that we're looking through the screen, the ones that stick out most are the ones that just have a pull quote that really talk about the results. Um, those are seem to be the, that simplicity is, is, is something that I think is, is overlooked sometimes when people try to get in the, in the weeds of all that they do. You can talk about that when you get the interview, but on paper, I think you just do the pull quotes of your highlights. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. And also, of course, sometimes you need to help them a little bit, just even with virtual uh, calls like today. I've noticed a lot of individuals, look how beautifully the, the backlit of, you know, Beth is here and, and beautifully put together and, and just a uh, delight to have a look at, in, in, you know, Beth and as she talks and her background. I do see a lot of people who are, are applying for jobs and doing even job interviews. I even had one yesterday and their background was dark. It looked like they were in, um, you know, perhaps witness protection. I could barely see their face. You know, it, it's just off-putting and yet they had a great resume and a lot to say, but it was so off-putting I found it distracting. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think sometimes just those simple things can make a quite a big difference about connecting immediately with your audience, whether that be face-to-face -face or virtually. So help people sometimes with that. I often would tell my team, uh, you need to do this or this to make your virtual, um, you know, frankly, your virtual connection, um, you know, just quicker and easier, uh, perhaps with either your team or your customers. Um, it says here, any recommendations on headhunters? Well, you know, I, I mentioned Egon Zender, the, Zender the, the Swiss. There's a couple of two big Swiss uh, headhunters uh, that are probably top in travel. There's also um, Spencer Stewart. There are many um, because, yes, it is competitive at the moment, and I think Beth's advice of LinkedIn is very important. I know on the aviation side we look at your LinkedIn may even look at your Facebook or Instagram as well. And I certainly know security do. So one of the things I would invite everyone to do is be so aware of their social media. When you're joining uh, big hotel firms, of course, like car, but in aviation where everyone is has a security screening and quite a security screening done not just by the airline, by others as well, just watch what you say and what you have links for uh, that are publicly uh, because we um, and this uh, ex external firm does look at those. Beth, anything on headhunters? No, I don't have a ton of experience. Spencer Stewart is a great one. Uh, some of the boutique firms are really good. Um, but, yeah, we don't, I don't do a ton of experience with, with the, the headhunters as much as you probably do, Alison. Right. And then, of course, we've got here a great question. What are your thoughts dealing with ageism when searching for a job? 
Well, you know, I think it takes everyone in order for a team and you need to have diverse teams. And that doesn't mean that's age, that's culture, um, you know, and that's making sure that we are fully uh, informed on our equity um, and making sure that you're really invested in this. So my advice on ageism is don't assume it's in place. Don't assume you're going to get judged by your age. Uh, ignore it. Do your, the best you can, because that's all we can ask of you, do the best you can. And don't assume that the, your age is an issue. Uh, it's obviously uh, against the law to have ageism, but, um, you know, sometimes it can be seen as, you know, preferable to have younger applicants. I personally don't agree with that. But I know, so I think you just put your best foot forward, never refer to it and make sure that you are up to date and modern uh, and researched in your outlook. Just make sure that, you know, continual learning, because number two on that Forbes list, that's what's important. Perhaps more mature uh, candidates is that they are up to date and continue to learn and be relevant to the, the current environment. Beth, any anything? Yeah, I, would only, I would only add is, do you, as we said before, do the research on the organisations that you're thinking and considering, and hopefully they have a lot of diversity and equality and sustainability and they have a really good culture and that that shouldn't even be an issue because they have such a robust area of just diversity and 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 you know legality really it is against the law you're right Elson. so i think uh, i think that's good advice i would just add that the one the one thing that i know we're kind of getting pressed for time but the one thing else and that we did not mention that you have an abundance and, and, I, and I try to have that within my team too, is, and it's not really on any of these Forbes lists or anything else, but it's intuition and it's humor. And, and sometimes humor gets us through the darkest hours, right? Within our team, if we can have a good laugh about even self-deprecation laughs. laughs. And, uh, I think that's one thing that sets you apart, Allison, is you're funny. And so people remember people who make them laugh and they wanna be around people who make them laugh. And I think you have a good balance of that. And you're not gonna see that on any list, but we talk a lot about that in our class and we talk a lot about it within our circle here at ABG. So I just wanted to throw that out to you too. That's cool. Thank you. And, um, you know, emotional intelligence is so important too. I, and I often find when I'm, I don't know about you, but I often find when I'm interviewing people, people will bring up what they think I might be perceiving as negative in them. Don't bring it up. Don't bring up the next, let, let them make their own decisions. Don't actively bring up, oh, you might be worried about my age because I'm such and such. No, okay. don't. They may not be thinking that at all, but I do find a lot of people do that. It's like they want to get ahead of it, but actually I wasn't even thinking that. Uh, and now they've raised it. Um, and so just make sure that you, you read something before you go into your interviews about best interviews and dynamic interviewing, behavioural interviewing. A lot of companies now are also doing behavioural interviewing. I do some behavioural interviewing uh, questions as well and to see if people are, are, are going to lose it with you, etc. or see what they will volunteer. It's always quite amazing. And so look up behavioural interviewing as well. Um, but, you know, emotional intelligence is just so important. Hey, and uh, Beth, I wanted to ask you as well, what is the best career advice you ever got? Oh, gosh, I'm still seeking advice, but I've had some good advice throughout the years. I would say uh, two things. Number one would be um, don't approach any situation and think someone's going to handle it the way you would. And, and if you do and you think everyone's going to handle it the way you would, you'll forever be disappointed. So that was always really good advice, personally and professionally. And also the other piece of advice is spend your time where you can have the biggest impact and value. I think we've all attended meaningless meetings right. uh, and I try to kind of triage those meetings and where our time is spent where we can have the most value and the biggest impact. Right, exactly. Well done. You know, honestly, my uh, best advice, and I know this sounds crazy, um, but some of my best advice actually was from Miguel Co. and he said, Alison, stop replying to all your emails. Just stop. And, you know, we can get so caught up in just being quick and getting back on that email and I, you've got to judge that for yourself and you obviously have to prioritise that. Um, and I do, I prioritise through, you know, frankly, customers, my team, etc. but just don't answer all the emails. Otherwise, you're going to spend your day doing that and that's not highly productive always. But again, pick and choose that as well. 
Now, I know, Lisa, oh, we've got one more question here from Barbara. Um, thank you, ladies, and great session. Thank you. Any recommendations for career coaches? Mm. Um, yeah, we have a – I'll send it to you, Barbara. We have career coaches now um, that are, are operating for a couple of our very senior executives, um, and they've been really helpful for them. And so I'll send that to you, Barbara, if you don't mind. I, I'm just uh, – Top of mind, I can't remember their name. Um, do any uh, Allison, Do any of the recruiter firms have career coaches? Yes, they do. Yeah, so that's always an option too. If you you know spend right. some work and you know some of those folks may have some as well. And our placement firms also have the yeah. career coaches and also the resume writers uh, as well. I um, also just wanted to make sure I took a moment just to thank Beth for joining me today. It's so good of you. I know how busy you are. Um, and you're just such a, a one, wonderful guidance. Um, and also to have someone who's an adjunct professor with us, uh, a real honour. So thank you very much, Beth. I really appreciate it. Alison, and anytime. I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, thank you. And, of course, we continue our learning sessions with Winnet. Um, and thanks to Lisa, who helps coordinate these as well. And you can see here, Winnet at work and at home, how you can successfully be a working mum as well. And I think that is so important at the moment. Um, and so I, I really look forward, and I'm actually going to be joining that one as well. And then, of course, we've got Lisa. We go on to the next. You can see the next four after that is Winnet with Influence then equity, then the right leadership behaviours. Now, these are important. I don't know about you, but when you work in large um, uh, faceted companies that are making sure you are agile and you not just your direct reports you have, you, you have to influence across the organisation um, in a matrix organisation with many companies are now. And so, you know, while I might have, you know, 6,000, 7,000 direct reports, you have to influence across the company. And so I think this will be a really um, a great session. And then, of course, nothing that can be more important or timely and then talking about diversity and racial equity and something that's very close to my heart. Then, of course, the right leadership behaviours. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Kristen and, of course, Rita and Laura on that as well. So I hope you've enjoyed today um, and I hope it's been um, uh, just a little drop of joy in your day and it's been helpful. Let me or Beth know what else you might need from us. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.